computer. Okay, so now we're recording. All right. So thanks everybody for joining tonight. Uh, I guess for the next, what is it? Eight nights. We'll try to do this on Sundays because I'm in my uh, class for the church on Thursdays at our regular time, which by the way is going really well. I love the class, but I'm a person that likes, likes learning, likes school. So of course I like the class, but uh, <laughs> we're still talking about Jesus tonight. Um, we're we're going to start looking at Jesus in uh, his main, I guess, uh, depiction in scripture. That's in the New Testament. And uh, for the uh, sister was there last week when I asked her and Julia a question. And so I'll ask it uh, of everybody else before we get into this so you can be thinking about it. In the, because we're going to start off talking about the genealogy of Jesus. Then we're going to talk about his birth, hopefully tonight. So in the genealogy of Jesus, there's two of them in scripture, one from the book of Matthew and one from the book of Luke. And in Jesus' genealogy, as in most genealogies in scripture, most of the people that are listed are men. But in Jesus' genealogy, there's actually three women listed. Um, besides Mary. And so the question I asked is actually a two-parter. Who are those three women and what's significant about each of those three? And we'll get to that, but be thinking about that as we talk. So again, we're in the, the Jesus in the New Testament and uh, up on the screen, my introduction says, this section addresses the life mission miracles and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth from his annunciation of his birth to the end of the church age, just before his second coming. It includes his ancestry, his birth, his ministry, his miracles, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of the father in heaven and his, oh, and I missed something. So who knows what goes after the, uh, his ascension to the right hand of the father that's in the New Testament. What's next after that? Anybody? What? Uh, uh, what was going on? After, after uh, so we we we've got a I guess a history, a life history of Jesus, Annunciation, his birth, his ministry, his miracles, his death, his resurrection his ascension to heaven, and then what's next? The return. Yep, his second coming. Is it you? So there it is. So that's what we're gonna be talking about in the New Testament. Okay, so the genealogy, uh, the Bible contains two accounts of the birth of Jesus and two different genealogies of his ancestry. The two genealogies are compared and contrasted I show how they're some in some places the same, but in other places different. And though these two lists of fathers and sons and a few mothers contain neither narratives nor doctrinal content, there's still important information that can be gleaned from looking at them. That's why we're looking at them. So there's not a anything more than so and so begat so uh, somebody else, or so and so was the father of or the son of somebody. That's all it really says. But still, there's a lot of information to be gained from that. So first off, does anybody know um, why there are two genealogies? If you like read ahead, maybe. Why is the genealogy of Matthew different from the one in Mark and Luke? Well, they, they, I'm sorry, go ahead. I don't know. I was gonna. I was gonna say. Um, we both. We all have two sides of the family. We have a mother side and a and a father side. Okay. And, yeah. Know, that's how we got here. Right. You know, I mean, everybody has that. That's no. It shouldn't be no different than Jesus. So he has a mother and a father side. Good. Right. Very good. And so. 
the second half of that answer then is why do we need to know his mother's side and his father's side? Because everybody else in scripture, all we know about is their fathers. But why does scripture tell us both about Jesus' father and about his mother? I mean, you gotta know what you I mean, I don't know. I mean, you got to know your history or how you came here. Right. And who's in your family. And you will. I, no, guess I, I agree you, with you. I agree with what you're saying. I'm just saying, think a little bit deeper. In, in the Bible, they really don't care about mothers, to be honest with you. Yeah. For the most part. But in Jesus's case, we get the genealogy through his mother. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit sent sent him through his mother. Okay. Should I say it like that? Right. So that's a right. chance. But why do we don't need to know the rest of it? And and the father part of it is God being of the universe. So it, it's not he's he's the uh, he's not of flesh. He's basically of spirit and faith. Uh, you know, you first get to know who recognize who God is. The creator okay. of the universe. All right. And, All right. Uh, spiritually, Jesus was born spiritually through the mother Mary. And Mary mm -hmm. is, to me, Mary is, is his mother host, although he was created spiritually. Okay. And it's also to show that he came through the lineage of David. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which one is that? Mary, Mary's, well, both, well, because of, because of during that time period, you know, the lineage was also is through the father. So Joseph being the stepfather, you know, of course they went through him, but then they have to do the mother's side to show that even, you know, because the man, God, man side of him came through the, through the mother, uh, and it was through the lineage of David, because of course, you know, he's from the seed from the Holy Spirit, you know, through God through that way. So there's not a lineage there, but from the mother's side is to show that, you know, through man, he came through what was prof prophesied and he came through the, David's lineage and his mother was from that side as well. Her mother, his mother was in the lineage. So David came through what was being prophesied. All right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, uh, it was kind of an unfair question because we haven't gone over this yet. But uh, to understand the answer to the question, you've got to understand, first of all, that the reason there are four Gospels is because the four Gospels speak to four different aspects of Jesus, and they are targeted towards four different audiences. So in Matthew's gospel, it speaks of the kingship of Jesus. It's aimed towards the Jews to show them that Jesus was their rightful king, just as Deacon was saying. So Matthew's uh, genealogy goes back to show that Jesus was in the lineage of David. And then it goes a little bit further back, all the way back to Abraham, because David was a king because he was a son of, of Abraham. So that's what, what Matthew tries to show. Luke tries to show the humanity of Jesus because it was written to explain Jesus to the Greeks. And the Greeks were, were people of, of science and they were big on uh, mankind and, and humanism. So Luke wrote to explain Jesus to the Greeks, to the humans. So his genealogy goes further than Matthew's does and it goes all the way back to Adam to show that Jesus was in fact human, that he, and remember the Greeks, in a lot of cases, the Greeks had what they called demigods. And mm -hmm. demigods were when the Greek gods came to earth 
and had relations with human women, and they would have children. Like an example would be Hercules was one, <laughs> half human and half God. So to appeal to those people, what Luke did was he showed that Jesus was both God and all human as well. So he goes all the way back to Adam. And then uh, Mark, of course, he was writing to the Romans and the Romans were very much militaristic. So that's what uh, the target of his gospel was. And that's why a lot of his gospel is written the way it is. And then John's gospel was written to the Israelites, uh, not to show that Jesus was king, but to show them that he was God. And so that's why in the beginning of John's gospel, he doesn't give a genealogy. He simply starts off saying in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's all the genealogy he, he throws in there because it shows that Jesus was God. So, but the answer to the question then is the reason that there are two different genealogies is because the Matthew's genealogy wants to prove to the Israelites that Jesus is their king and Luke's genealogy wants to prove to the Greeks that Jesus was a man even though he was also God and that's the reason for the two that's why they don't have the same people and that's why one goes through his father Matthew goes through his mother because the mother was in the line of King David. Uh, Luke goes through his father. I'm sorry, he goes just the opposite. Luke, Matthew goes through uh, Joseph because a king only passes down through the father's line. Uh, so Luke goes through his mother because she's the one that goes up, that can trace all the way back uh, in an unbroken line all the way back to, to Adam. So that's why the two are there. So you, you can, uh, that's one of the takeaways I want you to take from our study tonight is the reason there's two genealogies is because they're trying to prove two different uh, facts about Jesus. One is kingship and two is humanity. <laughs> All right, so now to the, the question that I asked. Uh, if we look in, this is Matthew's genealogy. Uh, what I've got up on screen right now, it talks about um, Tamar. It's, it's spelled with a T-H but it's actually uh, in English, we would normally spell it T-A-M-A-R. She was the widow of Judah's eldest son, Ur. And if you know the story, Ur died before he had any children. And so what happened was, uh, it was a tradition back in those days that if a man died, a married man died without having children, it was the responsibility of his oldest brother to marry his widow and to have a child for him. And the first son that that widow uh, bore didn't belong to the new husband. He actually belonged to the dead husband. So that the dead husband's line would continue. Now, any other sons after that would belong to the new husband. But that first son from that widow would belong actually to the dead husband. <laughs> so because Ur was dead, her father, which was Judah, promised Tamar, the widow, that she could marry his next son. And that next son was named Onan. And Onan was a bad person. Um, he didn't want to have children for his brother. So whenever they would have relations, he would withdraw before he came, and it, the Bible says literally he spilled his seed on the ground. Didn't he get in trouble for that? He didn't just get in trouble. He died. 
because of yeah. it. Yeah. So then it came, fell to the next son, but the next son was too young to have children. So Judah promised her, Tamar, that when the next son became old enough, that he would give him to her as her husband so that she could have a child for her uh, original husband. But when the son got older, Judah didn't do what he promised. So Tamar decided to take things into her own hands. So she <laughs> dressed herself up, self up as a, uh, a harlot, a prostitute, and she went and, and sat by the side of the road, a road that she knew that Judah often passed along. And she knew the type of person that Judah was. He was one that liked, to, liked the ladies. So when he came by, she uh, made herself visible to him. And he went to her and asked her what it would cost uh, for her services. And she told him all she wanted was uh, a certain amount. And he said, well, I don't have that on me right now. And she said, that's OK. Just let me have your seal and your uh we'll search at the top put in baby's mouth was your staff and uh you can go back home and i'll keep that as a, a deposit on what you owe me and when you come back you can uh get back your seal and your staff when you pay me but judah of course had no intention of ever going back because bob said to come up so she became what? pregnant uh, from that one meeting, she had a son, and everybody went and told her, your daughter-in-law has been out there uh, doing something wrong because she just had a son, and she ain't married to nobody. At which time, Judah, of course, became angry and decided he was going to go and take care of things, which meant he was going to go and have her stoned to death, which was the punishment for adultery. Okay. And for, for uh, uh, sex out of wedlock. So mm -hmm. when he got there, he uh, told her that he that she should get herself in order because something was about to happen. And of course, she then told him, "Well, by the Mosaic law, you don't just have to stone me; you got to stone mm -hmm. the father of this child too." And he said, "And who is that? So we'll take care of him too." And she says, "Well, whoever this staff and this seal belongs to." <laughs> of course he recognized the staff and he mm -hmm. recognized the seal and he realized that he had treated her wrong mm -hmm. so that's the story of Tamar so the question then was what is significant about her that she's listed in Jesus's uh, ancestry and it doesn't just say that uh, right. her father was Judas but it says that uh, it, it talks about the, the mother as well. Why is she one of the three mothers that's listed there? And it's on the screen, if you look at the screen. Oh, like Mary. Okay. Yeah, she pointed forward to Mary. Because remember, Mary's son was not the biological son of her husband. Mm -hmm. And Tamar's son was not the biological son of her husband. Mm -hmm. So Tamar is important because she was a type and a shadow of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Her son was not the son of her husband, but the one greater than her husband. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, God is greater than and Joseph, right? So Mary's, the father of Mary's son was one greater than her husband. And the father, Judas, is greater than the son, Ur. So Tamar's, the father of Tamar's son is also greater than her husband. Mm -hmm. So that's the significance of Tamar. Mm -hmm. And the next one is Rahab. And then Ruth was the other one. And I'm not going to go through all the stories of Rahab and Ruth, because I think most of us re remember those two stories. 
I went through the one of Tamar because that's one that you don't often uh, get taught. And, and so it's an unfamiliar one. So I figured it, it was worthwhile going through that one mm -hmm. and, and laying that one out. But Rahab, of course, was the, uh, the woman from Jericho who helped, uh, what's his name? Oh, man. Joshua. Joshua and the Israelites conquered Jericho. And uh, so they spared her life when they destroyed the city. And she married a, a, an Israelite and she, uh, her husband was in the line of, of Jesus' ancestry. But she's listed as well because she represents us Gentiles, non-Israelites being grafted in the God's family, the church. So that's why she's important because she pointed to the fact that it wasn't just Israel that was gonna be saved by God, that he wanted to save the rest of the world as well. And she was the first one in scripture that was grafted in as a non-Jew, a non-Israelite. And then Ruth is similar to that, but uh, there's a second reason Ruth is there because remember she was a Moabitess so she was also a foreigner that was grafted into the, uh, the family of God when she married Boaz. But uh, what's more important about her is the second reason is that Boaz was a kinsman redeemer. It, it goes back to that same thing I was talking about with, with Tamar is uh, in that succession, if there was no younger son, then it would actually fall to the next closest relative, male relative, to give that uh, dead husband a son. And so it would keep going until you found a, a relative who could do that for you. That was called the kinsman redeemer. And so in this case, Boaz became the kinsman redeemer who married Ruth. And Jesus was the kinsman redeemer for us non-Jews. In fact, he will marry the church eventually, but uh, Ruth is important because of her association with the kinsman redeemer. So she points forward to Jesus Christ. So that's why those three women are the only three women listed in Jesus's genealogy. Okay. I looked it up. I looked it up, Charles. Yes. Where do Bathsheba fit in there? Because I, I, yeah. I found I four. Well, there's more women there. Is Bathsheba listed? Yes. Yeah, she listed. Okay, I missed that one. The wife of Uriah. Okay. Um, you're going to make me search that one out. <laughs> well, I had looked it up uh, when you were saying it the first time. Yeah, I, I did too. And, and it gave me four. No, I'm, yeah. I'm looking again. She's not listed. She's referenced. I've got the verse right here. She's what? She's referenced, she's but really. she's not listed by name. The verse is right there. I got it highlighted. Verse 6. Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. But it doesn't list her by name. Okay. That was the distinction I was making. I, I didn't remember her being listed by name, and she's not. She, Yeah, she's referenced there. You're correct, but she's not listed by name. So by I, name. I, was, I was focusing on the three that oh, are. Oh, you, okay, you're right, because it, it's saying that it named the three Tamar, uh, Ray, Ray, Rahab? Rahab. Rahab and Ruth. Rahab and Ruth. And, and then it says the wife of, and then it has Bathsheba in parentheses. Okay, uh, that's a different translation then, possibly. Yeah. Which translation Definitely. are you looking at? Um, I just Googled it on, Googled uh, it up and that, that's how it gave me, gave it to right. me. 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'm going from the King James. But that's a good point, though. Bathsheba is listed by reference, not by name. Um, okay. So let me ask you then, what, what do you think is significant about the fact that it even said that uh, she had been the wife of Uriah? She she was. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, she was, but but why does it even mention her in passing? Even though it doesn't give her a name, why does it mention her at all? Because that's some David did. That's the king, that's the King David lineage. Okay. David, David's lineage. Because he did he did that. All right. So I guess uh, to rephrase what you're saying is it, it goes back to what I said before about uh, Jesus being, oh, and I don't have my light on, Jesus being the uh, in the lineage of David and without Bathsheba, he wouldn't be around because mm -hmm. Bathsheba was the one that uh, continued that lineage all the way down to Jesus. So I get you there. All right. Okay, yeah, so I can understand see. that one. So she can the, the reason she's there is because she continued the lineage of David. All right, so what I've got up here right now is what I was talking about earlier. In keeping with his objective of proving that Jesus was the legitimate king of the Jewish people, Matthew traces his lineage through his earthly father, Joseph. This was because Matthew knew that any claim that Jesus might have to an earthly kingdom had to come through the fatherly line. In other words, through Joseph. He could have just as easily established Jesus' relationship through his mother Mary, but such a relationship would not necessarily carry with it the right of kingship. And I, I, think, that, I think you said that's very key because if you remember when you know, Joseph could have put his wife away at right. the time. He didn't realize when, you know, it, you know, he could have put it away, but then the angel of the Lord had to come and tell him, hey, don't put him away because, you know, he's with God and she's not, you know, and y'all are supposed to be all a betrothed. And I think that's important. So David accepted that. I mean, not David, um, Joseph, Joseph accepted him as a king, which, which Matthew, I think is validating. So the because, you know, if he wouldn't have done that, the Jews were going to, they, you know, they, they seen him as illegitimate. Right. But they did, in fact, they would accept um, him as Jesus's father because they were betrothed. And, and so they wouldn't accept him necessarily as Jesus's biological father, but they would accept him as Jesus's father because he was betrothed to Mary, even though they hadn't uh, completed the marriage. And, and so that was the thing that Matthew was depending on. Now, does everybody understand what betrothed means for the, the Jews at the time? Because it's a little bit different uh, than being married, but it's also a little bit different than what we would today call being uh, engaged. Engaged. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit different. It's a, it's a different type of a status that we don't really have today. And the, the, the main difference is that until such time as the marriage was completed through uh, and consummated, there could be as much as a year or two take place. But still, the two people had most of the rights and responsibilities of people who were fully married. And it went so far as if they decided that they didn't want to be with each other anymore, they couldn't just walk away like, if I'm engaged to you and I don't want to marry you, I just say, okay, we're not going to get married and I go off and do my own thing. But in those days in, in Israel, if you were betrothed to someone and you hadn't actually fully married them yet, you still had to 
if you wanted to leave them, you had to get a divorce. No. And if you slept with somebody else, you were guilty of adultery already. It was so that's mm -hmm. something like the common law marriage thing. Don't get ready to say um, that too, yeah. You, you, yeah. you that, that's he, a good, I thought you common law, you've been living with a person for so long and you still consider common law, but even if you meet someone and now you want to marry this person, you still have to go back by law and divorce your commonly law husband or wife mm -hmm. in order to marry the next person. Good analogy. Very good. Yeah, that's true. You're yeah, right. That's good. That's it good. is true. Yeah, that's that, true. That's what betrothal was. Mm -hmm. So that's why, again, that Matthew traced through Jesus up to King David. I mean, to Joseph up to King David and then from King David all the way through to Abraham because he wanted to prove to them that Jesus was legitimately their king. And you remember, that's why uh, Herod wanted to kill Jesus in the beginning because the wise men came not looking for just a baby. They came looking for a new king of the Jews. Okay, and uh, this is something a little bit additional. Um, in, in, Jesus, in Matthew's genealogy, he breaks it down into three different groups, three different uh, sets of 14 generations or 13 generations, I'm sorry. And the first division of 14 was from Abraham to David. And this is, establishes the legitimacy of David's kingdom because David could trace his his birth all the way back and his line back to Abraham. So that made David legitimate to the, the Jews. And then once the divided kingdom happened after David and Solomon, the second division of 14 was from David to a king named Jeconiah. And he was the king of the southern kingdom after they divided into two, the southern kingdom of Judah at the time that it was finally conquered and taken over by the Babylonians. So it shows that up until the time of the Babylonian captivity, there had been an unbroken line of kings all the way from David, all the way down to Jeconiah. And they were all in the same family line. And then the last division of, of 14 is after the, uh, the nation of Judah disappeared and no longer existed, and the uh, Jews were uh, what they called the diaspora. They were spread out. They were scattered all over the world. Uh, and the, uh, the nation of Judah became a part of the Roman Empire, even though they still didn't have kings sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, you could still trace that kingly line all the way down to Jesus. Those guys weren't called kings anymore, but they still were there. And there was a, still an unbroken line that could be traced all the way from Jesus back to Jeconiah. So from Abraham to David, David to Jeconiah, and Jeconiah to Jesus, there's an unbroken string that shows all the way back that Jesus was, in fact, a descendant of David, and through David was a descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he was the legitimate king of Israel. And that's what Matthew was trying to show. Now, Luke is a little different, again, because Luke was trying to show that Jesus was a man. So Luke's genealogy doesn't stop at Abraham. It continues on. And in fact, if you look at it, uh, the genealogy in Luke from Adam to Joseph, I mean, the, the Jesus is, anybody know how many generations? We know 40 generations from Abraham to Jesus, but how many from Adam to Jesus? Hmm. Well, a total of 42, wasn't it? No, nope. not 42. I'm not sure whether I wrote it in here or not. Uh, the answer is there were 76. And 76 is significant 
Why is 76 generations significant? Break it up into two numbers, not one. It's half a century? No. What's seven? Oh, completion. And whose number is seven? God's number. Okay. And what's six? That's man. Right. Oh, it is right there. Right there. Here it is. God and man. According to Luke's gospel, Jesus is the 76th generation, beginning with Adam. The number 76 includes seven, which is the number of God, and six, the number of man, symbolic, symbolically indicating that Jesus was both God and man. Mm. That's the significance of Jesus being the 76th generation. It wasn't by accident. Wow. So... Yes, question. Yolanda, you had a question? Mm -hmm. Uh-uh, well, uh-uh. No? No, no. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, the first 20 generations oh this is where uh, I bring out something if you look up here uh, you should have this in your, your, your reading material I compared not just Luke and Matthew but I also listed the uh, genealogy that's listed in the book of Genesis mm -hmm. And it's the same, except that in Luke, it talks about this guy, Canaan, who is the son of Arphaxad and the father of Salah. But in Genesis, he's not listed. And there's a reason for that. And I, I lay that out down here. Um, says the Genesis genealogy can be used to validate Luke. That's starting right here. Comparing the two genealogy lists shows them to be in close agreement with one exception. Genesis lists Sala as the son of Arphaxad, but Luke identifies him as the son of Canaan and the grandson of Arphaxad. And so this is the second Canaan in, the, in addition to the one who both Genesis and Luke list as the son of Enos and the great grandson of Adam. This Canaan was included in the Greek Septuagint, but does not appear in the Masoretic text, the authoritative Hebrew and Aramaic text of the 24 books of the Hebrew Bible. Helen Jacobus was, has proposed that Canaan had been intentionally included or excluded from Masoretic text by the Hebrew scholars because they considered him to be subject to a curse, the curse of Canaan, which was possibly a misinterpretation of the curse of C-A-N-A-A-N -A -A from Genesis 9 and 24 through 27. You guys remember in the, uh, that when Ham went in and saw his father naked in his tent, his father being Noah, that Noah cursed, not Ham, but he cursed Canaan. And so what this is saying is that the, uh, the Jews who wrote the, the Masoretic text, they thought that this Canaan, C-A-I-N-A-N, was the Canaan that uh, Noah had cursed. So they left him out of the genealogy. It's not that he didn't exist. Is that they didn't want to put his name there because he was a curse. And if he was in the line of Jesus, that would mean that Jesus was the result of a curse. But they were looking at the wrong person. So that's why it looks like there's a difference there, but there's really not. Does everybody get that? If you ever see that, that and anybody ever asked you, why is or does Genesis 
and Luke not agree in that one place right here. It doesn't agree because the Jews took this guy Canaan out because they thought he was the other Cain. And if it was the Canaan that they thought it was, was supposed to be, he wouldn't be here as the son of Arphaxad. He would actually be in place of Arphaxad because he would have been the uh, a brother of, not a son of, that Canaan. Or not a brother or cousin. He would have been a son of Shem's brother, Ham. So there would have been Noah, Ham, Canaan. Not Noah, Shem, and our facts had it. It's a different Canaan. Uh, anything else? Uh, I think that's all I wanted to talk about in the genealogy. I'm not sure we got a whole lot of time to get into Jesus' virgin birth yet. But uh, I recommend that you go ahead and for next week, read through what I've got there. Look especially at uh, some of the symbolism from uh, Jesus' birth, his uh, nativity. There's a lot of symbolism there besides just him being born, uh, especially even with the uh, the what we call the three wise men. Bible never one never says there were three, uh, but the gifts that they brought. I provide a lot of information, I think, in there about uh, the symbolic nature of those three gifts. Uh, they're very Im important to understand the symbolism there, because it wasn't just gifts that they brought. There was a reason that uh, they brought those three. Mm. And in fact, there's a huge amount of symbolism, not just one level of symbolism but there's level upon level of symbolism that's hidden in those mm -hmm. three gifts and that's what we'll go over next week because we're already at 741 uh, we normally want to take a break at 745 so this one was a short one because we started late but anybody have any questions about anything we talked about so far tonight or pr prior to tonight This is the time to ask that question that you started to ask, Yolanda. Uh, uh no, I was just, I was just confirming that uh, when we were talking about the seventy-six, the six meaning that the the day we were made, man. That's all. Right. Yes, and that's why six is the number of man. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was the day when we were created, and yeah. seven is the number of God because it's the perfect number, the first perfect number. So seven and six combined is the number of Jesus. Because he's both God and man in one. So next week then we're going to talk about his birth from a virgin. And we'll talk also about some of the, uh, the prophecies that his birth fulfilled. Because there's a number of those. And it will keep going from there. Anybody have any questions, even uh, about what we're going to talk about next week? If you have any questions, something about uh, the birth that you always wanted to know or understand better before we get there. We can do a preview. We won't get into any detail. No? Anything else anybody wants to discuss? Something that happened, uh, something you heard, something you saw, something you thought about, something you read over the last couple of weeks that we didn't meet? Okay. No? Uh, to, to me, I just thought that was a bit about it, sort of that you the gen the genie um the generations we have seven and six. Um I think that sort of goes in line of what we've been trying to learn in, in the class of God being, you know, Jesus being God in man. Yep. Yep. God and man. Exactly. Um, so yeah it's that's one of those things that it it's uh 
I guess, a, uh, a revelation that it, it makes the light come on when you finally see something like that. At least it does for me. You read stuff over and over and over again, and all of a sudden, you read it one day, and the light clicks on. You say, oh, that's what that means. That's why that is. It's not just something to read. There's a, a meaning behind it. Right. To me, it just shows how purpose, purposeful God is. And, right. You know, not anything that's a mistake in terms of there's things that are need that are unveiled. And it just shows the continuity of the word of God. And it is just really one story, the Bible. Correct. And the other thing to me it always shows is it shows the uh, the fact that you can read something over and over and over again and all of a sudden you read it one day and it makes sense differently than it ever did before. You thought you understood it before, but now you understand it, stand it a whole different way. That shows the, uh, it shows one of the, uh, I guess the duties and one of the, the the responsibilities of the Holy Spirit is he leads us into all knowledge, but he only leads us there when we're ready for that knowledge. So when we're ready to understand this one thing is when he makes us see it finally. Because if we saw it before, one, we wouldn't know what to do with it, or two, we'd do the wrong thing with that knowledge. So he gives it to us, he parcels it out when we're ready for it. And that's just not us individually, that's the entire human race. Because we know a lot more about the word than even maybe our parents did. And they knew more than people 300 years ago did. And they knew more than people a thousand years ago did. So revelation is always evolutionary. Wow, yeah. It continues to evolve as God sees that we're ready to get more of it. That, and that's part of uh, what the whole book of Revelation to me is even all about. Um, he reveals things to us uh, over time so that we can respond to them as we need to. But uh, he doesn't re reveal to us everything because we wouldn't know what to do with it if he did. And that's actually something I just realized. That's something that I said during the class the other day. Yeah, you're yeah. talking about being unsearchable. Right. Uh, and un... Um, incomprehensible. Incomprehensible and unsearchable. Yeah. Unsearchable means we couldn't find it if we looked forever. And mm -hmm. incomprehensible means that even if we did find it, we wouldn't understand it. So he gives it to us as we're able to understand it and use it. And that's, that's the wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit and about his word. So we, you, it's not like another book where you can read it and once you get to the end, you say, oh, okay, I read that book. Now I don't need to read it ever again. But the scriptures, you can read them every day of your life and every day you'll get something new out of it. You can read the same verse every day of your life and get something new out of it every day. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I hope that we'll be able to do in this class is always get something new and different out of the word. So do we have any uh, prayer requests? Mm -mm, just pray for your brother. Well, we're going to pray for him, yes. Really enjoyed this. Uh, yeah, today was really, really good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, taking right. Nita to court tomorrow. So okay, so we'll pray for Nita. And I would say pray for Kiana. Just, just know she's she is whole and healed through her uh, okay. illness from here something, but um, but yeah, she's just strengthening, getting her strength back. Okay, praise God. All right, let's go ahead and pray for those things. Father God, we thank you once again for unfolding your word, for, for revealing it, Father God. Because your, 
Revelation, Lord God, is always progressive and evolutionary, Father. So we thank you that you showed us things tonight, Father God, that we were ready to understand and we will use them, Father God, right. So we thank you for your word once again, Father. We thank you for the revelation of your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord God, to never lose the desire to glean more from your word, Father God. We thank, thank you Jesus. for your son, Lord Jesus. We thank you that he was born not just as the king of the Jews, but as the king of kings, Father God. That he is not just man, but he is also God. So yes. we thank you, Father, for who thank he you. is. We thank, thank you for what he did for us, Lord God, individually, and for mankind as a whole. We thank you for sending your spirit to live in us, to oh. open up your word to us, Father God. And right now, Lord, we lift up those three names that we just mentioned. We lift up Raymond. We lift up um, Shanita, Lord God. And we lift up Kiana, Father. And any other names unspoken, Father God, that are on our hearts, Lord God, we lift them up right now. We lift up yeah. every issue, every problem, Father. We lay them at your feet, knowing, Father God, that you are a problem solver. You are a, a sickness healer and injury healer, Father God. You are, Lord, the answer to every question. You are the solution to every problem. So we lay them at your feet, Father God, knowing in faith that all things are made right as we speak, Father God, that they are healed, they are whole, they are, once again, Father God, their bodies are acting rightly as you created them to be. So we thank you, Father. We ask that you would continue to bless each one of us individually, that you would bless this Bible study as a group, Father God, and that you would be glorified in all that we do and say. And we give you glory, honor, and praise right now, Lord, in your son Jesus' holy and righteous name. Amen. 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 All right. Let me stop the recording. Mm -hmm.